today, we are busy with the economic NSEC syllabus of Namibia. We are at 1.2 BNC. We will still look at the economic systems, but today we will specifically try to identify what is advantages and the disadvantages of a market and a planned economic system. We will also look at married goods and public goods, as I've mentioned in the previous lesson. And we will look at externalities. Um, externalities I will explain through social costs and social benefits. And then after that, for lesson seven, we will look at the features of a mixed economic system. Okay, just remember there are other names for uh, a market economic system. So if I ask you what is the features of a capitalist system, then you know I want the features of a market economy. If I ask you what is the features of a command economy, then you know I want the features of a planned economy. Okay. Um, if you sit, uh, you can also do homework on this. Take all these features which was given to you and discussed with you in the previous lesson and then identify which of these features is advantageous. That you can do in a 10 minute, 15 minute, uh, six, um, minutes, that will be enough for that. Okay, if we look at advantages for a planned economic system, the one good thing is that the government take into consist consideration externalities like pollution because um, they know how it affects um, the, uh, the people in the country and uh, their main aim is not to make pro profits. As I've said, they look after the welfare of the citizens. So that's normally an advantage for them. A very important advantage for this system is that the, all the money they earn from all their assets and all their businesses go to the government. You remember that. But what is good that they distribute all this money equally be, between everyone in the country. Yeah, so we can say that they, uh, distribution of wealth in this economy is more equally. And then in this economies, it is also very important to realize that they supply enough married goods and public goods and that they pay for all of that. It is supplied by the government and so they supply it efficient, efficiently. So for example, like free universities, that is the example of a married good. There are parks and recreation centers, which is the example of a public good, which the government also provide in a planned economy, which is all advantages of a planned economy. Okay, if we look at the advantages of a market economy, the shortages and surpluses that occur is very quickly solved by demand and supply. It is not such a long, expensive, time-consuming process like, than in a planned economy, which uh, the reason for them is they must make use, go back to the officials uh, of the five-year plan and they must do replanning. But in a market economy, it works through the forces of demand and supply and is quickly solved. You as a consumer can choose in a market economy and not only how much you want, what you want and in what qualities you want it, then people get financial incentives. So they try to work harder, they try to produce better quality. It's the same for firms. If you can get more profits by selling a better quality, that will definitely be your aim. Try to produce something else that somebody else is not producing or if you produce the same, try to produce it at a better quality or provide a better service. Okay, um, in a 
market economy, they are also less cost involved in the planning of this economy because there's no government in officials involved in working on the planning of this. So this is features for a market and a planned economy. Now I will explain to you just merit books. Now you have picked up through the previous lesson and this le lesson that a merit good is something uh, is supplied by the government. Why do the government supply merit goods in our country? And that is why I've said in the beginning that our country is a mixed economy or use a mixed econo economic system because they step in and they provide merit goods. So they provide hospitals and they provide um, schools. That is examples of merit goods and very relevant for you because the government do this. They know if it must be in the hands of the private sector, then it will not be supplied enough of it. And on the other hand, if the private sector supply, it, it will also be too expensive for everyone to afford it. So you can think of private hospitals or private schools as good examples that they are supplied by the private sector. But if that was the only schools and hospitals available, a lot of people in this country would not be able to afford these goods and services. So that's why a government step in and provide this type of goods and services that are not supplied efficiently by the private sector. Why is it not applied sufficiently? Because the private sector's aim is to maximize profits. And if they do it, they will ask prices that is not affordable for everyone in the country. Okay, if we then look at public goods and services, public goods and services are goods and services that the government also supply because the private sector don't want to supply it at all. Why don't the private sector want to supply it? Because these goods and services, you can't attach a price to the use of this good or service. So if I talk about a street light, I can't, um, say you must pay $10 to use this street light because um, you may never pass by that street light. So it's not possible for me to do, um, charge any person that use that street light because I don't know when they're using it, if they are using it, and so forth. So the main reason what I actually want to explain to you is very difficult in the case of public goods to attach a price to the good and service of this product. It is just the same as the city police in, the, in Vintu. They, so they supply a service, but they provide security to me, but I may not use them for one year. The, a year may pass that I never call them and I never make use of these services. So how will they charge me for this? Okay, so here is a product that the private sector don't supply because a price is not attached to it. And you understand if there's no price attached to it, they can't make profits. That's why the private sector don't supply it. Now the government step in, they supply public goods and services because they know that we need it. It improve the welfare of the citizens in the country. It's good for us to feel secure. It's good for us to be safe if we walk in the streets. And that's why they supply these type of products, which we call public goods and services. Okay, so if you now Remember, I have said one disadvantage of a market economy is that they don't supply merit goods and public goods. And you understand now why they don't do it. And in a planned economy, it is efficiently supplied by the government. 
Okay, then we look at social cost and social benefits. So you remember that I've said the private sector don't consider externalities because uh, when they do consider it, it will decrease their profits. And that is the reason why they don't take it into consideration most of the times. So very important, if I ask you what is social cost, you must tell me that it is the private cost and the external cost involved in the supplying or producing of a good and a service. So if I talk about private costs, this is the cost in that I can measure when I build, say, a hotel at the Avis Dam. So that is the wages, the cement, the sand, and all of that that are used in this production process. But um, the external cost is something I can't measure. So if they build that hotel near the Avis Dam, there will be lots of negative effects that occur, which we can't measure. We know that they are there, and we know that they exist, but we can't really put a value to that. So the animals like the kudus or the African eagles will not come there as they are doing now to drink water or to get, try to get food and so forth. So um, that is the external cost that will occur because they decide to build a hotel, for example, at the Avis Dam. So you will, if you answer a question like this, you tell me that social cost is equal to private cost plus external cost. You explain to me what is private cost and what is external cost. Remember, a private cost is um, experience by those who built this hotel. So those who got the tender to build it or those uh, involved in the construction of this. And external cost is experienced by a third party. So me and you that have always go to the dam to walk there, we will not see all the animals anymore and it will not be the same as in the past. So um, if you now ask me now what is external cost, then it is just your social cost minus your private cost and that what is left is the external cost that we say is a disadvantage for a market economy because they don't take it into consideration. Okay, then we have external benefits. This is just the opposite of external cost. External benefits, you also calculate the private benefits plus the external benefits give you the social benefits. So um, if, I, if you ask me what is private benefits, this is a benefit that can be measured so this is, for example, the rent or the, if they have a hotel, the wages that that workers will get, or if this is a person whose hotel it is, the profits he will earn out of providing accommodation to tourists. That is the private benefits. We can calculate it in accounting. Um, and then the external benefits will perhaps be the um, that, as I've said, it's not measurable in money. It is experienced by a third party. And there's people who can now work there that got training and that have a better standard of living. We can't actually measure it, but they can see they can afford a better, uh, better goods and services, so experience a better standard of living. Um, then it is also an external benefit that if they, for example, um, built proper roads to that area, that it also less stressful and more safe to drive there. Okay, and that will be all for today's lesson. Tomorrow or in the next lesson, we will continue with um, the rest of the mixed economic features.